You can be seated and you can uh, turn in your Bible to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I really do appreciate Noah jumping in and filling in, do such a good job for us as we worship through music. And now we're going to worship through the teaching of God's Word. And uh, the month of January, we're building an understanding on what it means to be a follower of Christ. And so I'm entitling the series, Follow the Leader. And and we're talking about what it looks like to be a Christ follower. And one word for that is a disciple. A disciple is someone who follows Christ. And we're studying this concept based on John chapter 15. So hopefully by the end of this month, you'll be very familiar with John chapter 15. And John 15 has a key word in the first 17 verses. It's scattered throughout the first 17 verses. It is the word abide or remain, depending on your translation. Last week, I defined that word for us. And it means to be in authentic, staying relationship. It means to remain in a situation. So instead of getting out of a situation or instead of jumping out of a relationship, it means to stay in the relationship, stay in the circumstances, the, the situation. Last week, we looked at entering into that discipleship, and it was by being born again. We looked back at John chapter 3, and we looked at the concept of being born again. And last week, I mentioned that there are some days I do better living out John 15 than other days. In other words, there are some days I do a better job abiding than other days. And so because of that, if we're going to talk about discipleship very long, we have to eventually talk about discipleship and its role and how it's connected with obedience. So today we're going to talk about you know, the connection between discipleship and obedience. And to do that, we're going to look at John 15, verse 10. So you can look at John 15, find verse 10. I actually want to pick the verse before it and the verse after it to help us understand kind of where John 15, 10 lies. So you have it in your Bible. John 15, verse 9 says this, As the Father has loved me, I've also loved you, so remain in my love. Verse 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I've kept my father's commands and remain in his love. Verse 11, I've told you these things so that my joy may be full in you and your joy may be complete. Now, we looked at a definition from last week. I want to show it to you again on the screen. It comes from Avery Willis in his in his book called The Disciples' Cross, it says this, Christian discipleship is developing a personal, lifelong, obedient relationship with Jesus Christ. In which, and here's the part we're going to work on today, in which he transforms your character into Christ's likeness. That's part of what being a disciple is, is that God is always working on us, changing our character into Christ's likeness. And then the rest of that definition says, changes your values into kingdom values and involves you in his mission in the home, the church, and the world. So let's look at and think about character transformation a little bit. Character transformation is a journey. It's not something that you wake up one day and you arrive and you have all the character that you need. Character transformation is a journey and the curves and the dips and the high spots on that road is obedience. Every chance you get to be obedient to God is a chance to go further down the road of character change and turning into looking more like a Christ follower. Last week, I pointed out the connection in verse 9 between God loving Jesus, Jesus loving us, and how because of that we are to love him. Now, verse 10 does the same thing. It makes a connection between God, uh, Jesus obeying God, and because Jesus obeys God, we ought to obey God. But I, I want you to notice that there is an extension in this that it, verse 9 goes from love, and verse 10 takes love to obedience. So what I want us to see here is that we can talk about loving God all we want, but our obedience is what demonstrates if we're actually loving him or not. It's easy to say we love someone, but our actions show if we actually love that person or not. And the same thing is true spiritually. So for today's message, I, I want to take three different 
couplets, three, three sets of dual words, and use those words to show us what does it mean, what is the connection between discipleship, following Jesus, and obedience. The first set of words I want us to look at is love and obedience. So, so look at verse 10 as we look at love and obedience. First in verse 10, it says, if you keep my commands. What is meant by that word command or commands? The word means an injunction, an authoritative prescription. Now, what did Jesus have in mind when he said, keep my commands? Maybe Jesus was thinking about the Ten Commandments. I mean, that would be a good thing to live by. It's a good thing for us to live by. Maybe that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, keep my commands. Or maybe Jesus was talking about the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who do this, who do this, who do this. It's in the first part of Matthew chapter 5. Maybe Jesus was talking about the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. He has all these instructions you know, about anger and about lust and about divorce, all these different things he has in there. So maybe that's what he's talking about when he says, keep my commands. But actually, a man came to Jesus one day and asked him, what's the greatest command? It's recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus' response. Matthew, in, in the Matthew account, it says this. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40 says this. So the man's asked him, what's the most important commandment? This is what Jesus says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophet rest on these two commands. So Jesus didn't quote the Ten Commandments. He didn't quote his own words from the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't quote the, the, the Jewish law in the Old Testament. He said, everything lands on these two commands. Love God with all that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything rests on that. So I think that's a pretty good place for us to land when Jesus says to keep my commands. Those are two pretty good commands to land on. And then let's look at that word keep when he says that you need to keep the commands. The word keep means to guard from loss or injury. It means to keep an eye on something so that it does not escape or you do not lose it. It can mean to build a fortress around something to protect it. It can even mean to keep something away from something else so as not to mar it or harm it. So if there's something that's valuable to you and you don't want it to rust or you don't want it to decay, you secure it in a safe place so that rust or decay does not occur. That's what the word keep means. And the word keep is a very serious word. I, I want us to understand that. It's, this is a very serious instruction when Jesus says, keep my commands. He's talking about, you need to keep it. With all that you are, you need to guard loving God with all that you are and loving your neighbor as yourself. But the word keep, as important as it is, doesn't mean perfect. This is not a call or an expectation that you're never going to sin. Now, it's not permission. I'll talk about that later. It's not permission for us to sin, but it's not a command to, to, to not sin because God knows that sin is going to happen even in the Christian's life from time to time. So even though God is holy and he's just and he's righteous and he fully deserves all of our respect, all of our awe, even our fear, I mean, we ought to be afraid of God, still we should be motivated to, to keep God's commands also out of love. Now, I need to keep God's commands because I'm afraid of him too. But more importantly than that, I, I need to keep God's commands because I love him. I'm in a love relationship with him. I want to honor him. I, I want him to be pleased with me. I want him to look at me and smile. I mean, he's the, he's the greatest there is. He's the, the, the deity of the universe. And so I want him to be happy with me because I love him. And more importantly, he loves me. So love drives that obedience. In Matthew 7, verse 21 Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Did you know not everyone who says I'm a Christian is actually a Christian? Not everyone who says, well, I'm, I, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus. Not everyone who says that, or not everyone who even says a prayer, well, I, I prayed to God, or I pray to God, isn't that enough? 
Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. We can say we are Christians, or maybe we can say we're a pastor or a deacon or a Sunday school leader, but our actions will say who we really are. Either we're obedient or disobedient, and those will determine who we really are. We cannot compartmentalize Christianity. We, we, we can't like say, okay, 80% of me is really Christian, but there's this other part of me that just really wants to be Kevin. I mean, there's this part of me that really likes this. Maybe it involves my finances. Go with my finances, I'm gonna be Kevin. Or maybe it involves what I watch on TV. What I watch on TV is gonna be Kevin. Or maybe it involves my relationships with people. And so I'm going to fly off the handle in anger because that's just who I am. That's, that, that's my personality. Or maybe it's an unhealthy relationship with someone. I can't compartmentalize and give an excuse for this small portion of my life. God wants to invade every bit of me. And when I enter into a Christ relationship, a saved relationship, a born-again relationship, God begins to start working on that little percent I don't want to give him. He begins to tr start trying to maneuver and take over that to be Lord of my life. So we've got love and obedience. The second set of words to look at is obedience and repentance. So first we connected love with obedience. Now let's connect obedience and repentance. If Jesus tells us to be obedient, to remain in his love, then what do we do when we momentarily are not obedient? Now, obviously, that's nobody in this room, but you know those other folks. That momentarily, you're not obedient. What, what do we do when those times in our life come and we are momentarily not obedient? God is holy. The Bible says that God calls us to be holy. And so when I sin... The holiness is damaged, and my relationship with God is blurred. It becomes muddy. It's like a strained relationship when there's tension between Diane and I over something. Oh, we're still married, and we still love each other, but we both know, man, you can cut it with a knife. It's sharp. Well, the same thing can be true in the relationship with God. I'm not saying that you're not saved. I'm not saying you don't love God and God doesn't love you, but we know when sin is in our life, it muddies the relationship. It strains the relationship. In John 15, 2, it says that God prunes me so that I'll be more fruitful. When there are things in my life that aren't beneficial, God prunes that away. John 15, 6 is a little bit more aggressive. In fact, it's a lot more aggressive. It says we lose our spiritual purpose and that we are discarded. Whatever term you want to use to call it. I mean, you may call it backsliding. You may call it that you need to rededicate. You know, some people, we normally don't use this term in Baptist churches, but some people will say, well, they, they lost their salvation. Uh, other people will say, well, they were, they were never really saved. It doesn't matter what term you want to call it. You can't get over it without repentance. It takes repentance to get over whatever you want to call that situation. Now, let me show you three things about repentance. First, repentance is a part of abiding. If you're going to abide in Christ, there's going to come times when you have to repent because you're going to sin sometimes. When we enter into the relationship with Christ, we are entering into an unavoidable collision with God's will. Because here I am still encased in this flesh, and this flesh still has things it likes to do. God's will is holy and perfect, and here this flesh is going to collide with God's holiness. So there's going to be times in my life where there is tension between the flesh and what God wants in his holiness in my life. So repentance is necessary for discipleship. Uh, the, the definition in the Bible for repent, the word repent, means to reconsider and experience a change in one's thinking so that their behavior changes. That's what biblical repentance is. It's my thinking changes so that my behavior changes. Now, what we normally think of repentance is we think we need to change our actions, but what God's trying to do is to get our thinking about that sin to change. Because if my thinking changes, then my behavior will follow suit. 
I like what Steve Gallagher, his definition of repentance is. He says this, spiritual repentance is an experience whereby a person's desire, you might say their heart, their will, is altered for the express purpose of bringing it into line with God's desire or heart or will. Repentance describes the transformation of a person from being one who does his own carnal desire to one who does the desire of the Heavenly Father. That's what repentance is. Repentance is I stop doing what Kevin wants to do and I start doing what God wants to do. That's what repentance is. Second thing about repentance, there is a difference between repentance and being sorry over sin. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10 on the screen. He says, Now I am rejoicing not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you were grieved as God willed so that you didn't experience any loss from us. For godly grief produces repentance not to be regretted and leads to salvation, but worldly grief produces death. Now, what is he talking about this worldly sorrow, this worldly grief? When someone feels bad because they sin, normally they feel bad because of the consequences of that sin. So I did this, and the result of this is something bad happened to me, and I don't like that bad happened to me. So I did some bad things with my finances, and the result of that is I got in financial trouble. What I don't like is that I'm in financial trouble. I, I really don't dislike the sin. I dislike the consequence for the sin. And normally, even lost people, even people who don't even have a relationship with God, they will experience that type of sorrow, that type of, they might use the word repentance, that, that type of grief. They are grieving because they got caught because of the consequences. So let, let's say uh, that they did something in their marriage that was inappropriate, and the result of that is they got, that there, there was a divorce, and they hate that that divorce occurred. They wish that that divorce did not occur. But it's only because of the consequences. They, they don't necessarily grieve over their behavior. The true Christian, true repentance, is that even if God removed all the consequences... I don't want to sin because it hurts God. Because it affects the relationship between me and God. Even if I never got caught, even if there were no consequences, if God could magically wave a wand and remove all consequences, I don't want to sin because it affects God and my relationship with God. That's what true repentance is. It's when self-will is crushed by Jesus' presence. So I don't want to do what I want to do, but I want to do what Jesus wants to do. There, there are many people who do not want to be saved from their sins. They want to be saved from hell and the consequences of sin. But the, the only God acknowledges an attitude in which I am sorry because it has hurt my relationship with God. That's authentic discipleship. The third thing about uh, repentance is that pride is the biggest hindrance to genuine repentance. If you have ever had the chance to read about some of the great spiritual awakenings that came through America in the uh, late 1700s and early 1800s, you would read about in their revival services, their tent revival services, or even in what we would call their church services, how people would just would break down and they, they would start wailing and crying and screaming because they were under such conviction from the Holy Spirit because they were so overwhelmed because of their sin. And so as I read about those things and, and, and heard about those things, I, I began to ask, well, why don't we do that now? Well, it, I guess it's just because we're so much better than they were back then, right? I mean, that's, that's got to be what it was. We just don't sin near as much as they did. Well, of course that's not it. It's because something has happened over, over the last several hundred years in the church in which pride has come into the church pew that we cannot be broken in front of other people because we're afraid of what they'll think about us. And maybe part of that is deserved because of the gossip that runs through the church. I, I, I don't know. But we need a sense of brokenness, and pride is what stops us from repentance. Pride of what people think about us in church, 
prideful about our reputation in the community when really the only thing we ought to worry about is what God thinks about us. We're worried about what I think of you and what you think of me and what the people next to you think of you when, we, when none of us are worried about what God thinks about us. And repentance, its biggest enemy is pride in the Christian life. Well, we've looked at love and obedience. Then we looked at obedience and repentance. And now the third couplet is repentance and grace. Now, I want to show you the progression. This is not by accident. We started with love, and the way you show love is through obedience. But when I'm striving for obedience, there's going to be times that I fail, and that leads to repentance. Now I want to show you how repentance is connected to grace. Now, there, all this ties in. It starts with me loving God, but if it wasn't for God's grace on this other end, I'd be in bad shape. I do not have the ability to love God enough. I need God's grace at the very end. So let me show you the connection between repentance and grace. I'll give you four statements. I'll move through them fast. The first statement is this. Grace is God being patient with us, so we will repent. The Bible says that God is long-suffering, that he's patient with us, that he doesn't want any to perish but God's what's called his forbearance or his patience doesn't mean that God's going to ignore our sin. It doesn't mean that God's going to recant his judgment on us. It, what it means is that he's postponing judgment to give us the chance to repent. So don't think that God is this doting old grandfather that forgets our sin or he just really overlooks us because he likes it because he likes us so much. No. God is giving us a chance. He's waiting. He's patient with us because he is waiting to get us to the point of repentance. You know all those wonderful positive traits we like to talk about God? How God is love and God is gracious and God is merciful and he's kind and he's forgiven, forgiving. All those are wonderful terms. The only thing is, is they don't change the fact that God will judge us and the only reason why he hasn't is he's giving us a chance to repent. Second thing about uh, repentance and grace is grace makes obedience possible. Grace actually makes it so we can be obedient. Bible commentator William Barclay wrote this. He says, grace is not only a gift, it is a grave responsibility. And we want to think about how, how grace uh, is such a wonderful gift, and oh, we just appreciate God's grace. And so grace is a responsibility. I mean, God giving us grace calls us to a level of responsibility. See, a man cannot keep living the way he was before meeting Christ. The door is open for anybody to come to Christ. But when you come to Christ, the door isn't open for you to stay in the same condition. When you come to Christ, he expects change. He begins to create that change. And if you want to come to Christ and not change, you're not coming to Christ. He will not accept that. Uh, it kind of reminds me of a, of a train, how grace liberates us to obey like the railroad tracks liberates a train to move. Now, you could look at a train and say it's so confined. You know exactly where it's going every time. It's so confined. It's not like a car. You can get in a car and go anywhere you want. But if you want to pull tons and tons and tons of stuff, you need a train. You don't need a car. And the thing about a train is, if it had liberty and could go anywhere it could go, it wouldn't go anywhere. See how far a train goes when it's off the tracks. Within a few yards, it's piled into the dirt or the sand. The tracks, though it seems to confine it, actually liberates it. So it is with God's grace where God calls us to, to obey and he demands that we obey. We may think that's so constraining, but actually it's on those tracks of obedience that we get to experience the greatest of God's grace. That leads me to the third thing about grace, and that is grace provides a safe place for repentance to occur. See, when a Christian repents, he or she doesn't need to punish themselves. And there may be some people in this room that need to hear that. You're still beating yourself up for something that happened 30 years ago. 
20 years ago, 10 years ago. And when you come to God and his grace, God's grace is a safe place where you can repent. You and I do not have to earn our way back to the Father's goodwill. When we confess our wrongs and our actions and we turn from our wrong and we turn to Christ, Christ willingly accepts us and he begins immediately the healing process in our life. That's what the field of grace does. It provides a safe place where I might not be a safe place. You know, there are people that you go and you tell your deepest, darkest burden to, and what do they do? They gouge you with it. They, they use it against you. Not so with God's grace. It's a safe place that the Christian can come and be honest and repent. The fourth thing about grace if grace were a teacher, grace teaches us how we can please God. When the temptation comes in the Christian life, grace reminds us of who we really are, that we are God's child. Grace teaches us to say no to things. Grace reminds us that, that others have faced similar temptations and they didn't give in to it, so there's the same power that, that we don't have to give in to it. And grace on an everyday basis makes it so that, that I love self-control. I love righteousness. I love holy living as much as I love the tantalizing things of the flesh, in fact, more. Verse 11 says, when we are obedient, the result is that we have authentic joy, that Jesus has this joy and he passes this joy on to us. As Noah makes his way to the front and in the uh, praise team. I want to look at a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, lived in the uh, early 1900s. He was uh, really involved uh, uh, in, in trying to, to counteract and fight Hitler. He was put to death by the Nazis in a concentration camp, but before that he was able to write a massive book that is still used today entitled The Case for Discipleship. And I just want to look at a, a quote on the screen from Dietrich Bonhoeffer in this book. It says this. He's, he's talking in this paragraph about what cheap grace is. He says, cheap grace is pr the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. And he goes on and on with these other analogies. That cheap grace is basically you can come to God and you don't have to change. So he talks all about this cheap grace. Then he comes to this. He says, costly grace. Now listen to this. Costly grace is like a treasure hidden in the field and which one is willing to sell, to give up everything to receive. It is costly, he says, because it costs Jesus his own life. And it is grace because it gives a person the only true life there is. So obedience is costly. Man, it costs Jesus his own life. But the grace part of that obedience is that it makes it when we are obedient the only real life we can have. So I, I want you to think about a couple of areas in your life that maybe you're struggling with obedience. Let's take relationships. Are there some relationships that are way out of whack, family members you won't even speak to? Anger flares up. Are there some unhealthy relationships with the opposite gender that shouldn't be happening? Think about relationships. What about your clock and your calendar? Think about your clock and your calendar. What's on your calendar that really is getting in the way of God? And thirdly, what about your banking account, your bank account? What about money? Where, where's your money going? Follow the money. That'll tell you where your heart is. In any of those areas, do we need to be honest before God and repent? Move towards obedience. And in that field of grace, God will accept us and forgive us. God, I pray for Christians in this room that we would see we can come to you
and receive your forgiveness if we are honestly broken before you. And God, for um, people in this room that are not Christians, Lord, I pray that they would see that you want a relationship with you, that even right now, you are tapping them on the spiritual uh, so, uh, shoulder and you're calling them to enter into a relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that they would see that they can repent and by faith believe Jesus died on the cross for their sins and embrace the lordship, the kingship of Jesus in their life. God, I pray in this time of decision that you would work as only you can do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.